Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GRE. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the official guide to the GRE, the third edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today is our lesson number 67. Day Day 3067, 3 is to indicate that we are in the third edition. Third edition, day 67. We are on page number 263. There are two problems that are left there that we haven't done yet. Number 20 and 21. Those are the ones. Those are the ones that we're going to tackle today. Number 20. Number 20 is a very straightforward, very simple problem dealing with circle. We are told that we have a circle whose equation is. x minus 1 whole squared plus y plus 1 whole squared equals 20 squared or 20 rather not 20 squared 20 well what's the standard form of the circle the standard form of the circle is this x plus a whole squared plus y plus b whole squared equals r squared if that's the standard form here in this form the center is negative a and negative b. You have, to, you have to understand that if it's positive b, positive a and positive b in here, the center is located at negative a and negative b. If it is, uh, it should technically actually be the standard form is negative here and the circle is going to, center is going to be positive and there we go. And r squared, r of course is the radius. Here, we are not given the quantity in terms of square, we are given quantity simply as 20. So we are going to put this quantity in a form that has a square on the top. How are we going to do that? By putting a square root sign on it and squaring the whole quantity. So now we can immediately see that, that, that for this given circle, for this given circle, the radius, radius is not 20, but rather the radius is square root of 20. Square root of 20. What is the center of it? The center is right here. The center of the circle. This is negative 1, so it's going to be positive 1, the x coordinate of the, of the center. This is positive 1, so it's going to be negative 1. So the center of the circle is uh, positive 1 and uh, negative 1, the, the coordinates. And the radius is square root of 20. Let's carry on. Let's carry on. Now, if you wanted to approximate what square root of 20 is, we can very quickly do that. Square root of 20, if you wanted to approximate, square root of 20 is same as square root of 4 times square root of 5. The square root of 4, we can take out. Square root of 4 can be taken out as 2. Square root of 5, and square root of 5, we know is approximately 2.2. How do we know that? Because we have done it many, many times. We have done this approximation many, many times. Square root of, square root of 5 is 2.2. We can do it one more time quickly. 22 times 22. 22 times 22, 20 times 2, 20, 22, 22 times 2 is 44, 4, carry 4, again 22 times 2 is 44, plus 4 is 48, what this tells us, what this, what this tells us is that, what this tells us is that, 2.2 times 2.2 equals 4.84, and therefore, we know now, we know now, that the square root of 4.84, is exactly equal to 2.2 and therefore and therefore the square root of 5 is approximately 2.2 the argument being that 4.84 is approximately 5 that's the approximation we're making here so it's 2 times 2.2 it is simply 2 times 2.2 but now the way it's written is wrong the way it is written is wrong because it's, it is not equal to now we have to change that to approximation sign and 2, two, two times 2.2 2 is 4.4. So the radius of this particular circle, the radius of this particular circle is equal to square root of 20, or which is approximately 4.4. Let's look at the area. Area is simply pi r squared, which is part c. The area is equal to pi r squared, pi. Now remember, what was given to us was the r squared. What was given to us is 20. 
what was given to us was 20, which is the r squared. As I said, radius is not 20, the radius is square root, of, square root of 20, and therefore 20 represents r squared. So pi r squared, r squared is 20, so it's simply 20 pi. The area is simply 20 pi. Circumference, circumference is simply 2 pi r, and here again, you have to pay attention that the r is square root of 20. So it's 2 times pi times square root of 20. That's the circumference. And that's all there is. That was number 20. Very straightforward, very simple. Where we're going to spend our time is number 21. Because that's, that's where we have to that's where we have to do some talking. Let's take a, let's take a look at number 21. Number 21 says provide provide domain and it says describe f of x and its shape and its shape and also provide x and y intercepts. So for each of these functions that are given to us, and there are five of them, a, b, c, d, and e, for each of these five functions that are given to us, we have to describe, we have, we have, we have to provide its domain, and even though the book does not ask for it, we are also going to provide the range. And we'll talk about in a second what, what it means to provide range and to provide the domain. What does it mean? What do the terms domain and range mean? We'll talk about that in a second. Then we have to describe this function a little bit, provide its shape, and finally provide its x and y intercept. In other words, find out where it cuts the x-axis and the y-axis. Let's get going. Part A. Part A says that f of x, which is our y, is equal to negative 4. That's all. It's just negative 4. Well, what does it mean? Which means that when x is 0, y is 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, right here, or rather negative 4, sorry, 1, 2, 3, 4, right here, when x is 0, y is negative 4, when x is 1, y is negative 4, when x is 2, y is negative 4, when x is 5, y is negative 4, when x is negative 7, y is negative 4, why? Why? Because x doesn't appear here. X, the value of x has nothing to do with the y. Y does not depend on x. Because there is no x in the function. It's a constant function. Y simply equals negative 4. What's the shape of this function? Well, right here, the shape of this function is a straight line. It's a horizontal line at y equal to negative 4. At y equals to negative 4. What is the shape of this function? It's a straight line. It's a it's a, it's, it's a horizontal line, horizontal line, parallel to x-axis at y equals to negative 4. y equals to negative 4. Now let's talk about the, let's talk about the domain. Let's talk about the domain. What does the word domain mean? Domain simply means what does the word domain mean? Domain simply means what are the what values can x takes? Can, what values what values can x take? Are there any restrictions on the values that x can assume? And here as we saw the function, it's a very straightforward function, 1, 2, 3, 4, this is our function right here, y is equal to negative 4. x can take any values for us, there, is, there are no restriction on x, there are no limitations. What values can x take? The answer is here, here, x can take, x can take any value it wants to be, any value it wants to have. 
X can have a, X can be negative, positive, fraction, whatever you like, doesn't matter. How do we say this in the language of mathematics? X can be whatever it wants to be. As we said, positive, negative, fraction, zero, one, doesn't matter. There are no limitations. There are, there are, there are no limitations. But the question is, how do we say, how do we say in the language of mathematics? In the language of mathematics, when we want to say that there are no limitations on what x can be, in the language of mathematics, we'll simply say the domain, domain is made up of all real numbers, all real numbers. Domain is, domain is a set of all real numbers. What is this x-intercept? What is this x-intercept? In other words, where does it cut the x-axis? Well, where does it cut the x-axis? Do you see? Where does it cut the x-axis? This is, this is the x-axis right here. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4, you see? Where does this line, the black line, cut x-axis? As we can clearly see, it does not. It doesn't cut x-axis at all. This is parallel. We just said it someplace. Or we just said it right here. It is a horizontal line parallel to x-axis. It's not, it's never going to cut the x-axis. What are the x-intercepts? The answer here is, there is, there are no x-intercepts. There are no x-intercept. There are no x-intercepts in English language simply means it cuts x-axis nowhere. What about its y-intercept? Where does it cut the y-axis? Y-axis. Well, right here. Right here. It cuts the y. Y-intercept is at y is equal to negative 4. That's where it cuts the y-axis. So, so far we have described we have described its range, we have described its domain, we have described its intercept. What else are they looking for? Its range. That's it. That's all they're looking for. That's all they're looking for. For each of the for for each of the following function, give the domain which we have done. Describe it. We just did it. We described it. We described it by the description that we gave was that it is a it is a it is a horizontal line parallel to y-axis at y equals to negative 4. That was the description. Get, including its shape, we just said it, it's, it's, uh, we just described the shape, and its x and y intercept. We are done. Let's take a look at number two. Part b, in part b we have an equation, we have a function that looks something like this. We are told fx equals 100 minus 900x. Let's rewrite it in the standard form. The standard form looks like this. A standard form, a standard form here would be the, the slope intercept form. Slope intercept form, which looks like this y is equal to mx plus b. y is equal to mx plus b where m represents the slope and b represents the y y intercept. How do we know that b is the y intercept? Because y intercept means the place where it cuts y axis, the place where the line cuts y axis at that point, whatever the line happens to be, if this is your line, it cuts y axis here. At that point, x is equal to zero. If x is equal to zero, if x is equal to 0, the question is, what's the value of y? Well, when x is equal to 0 here, it doesn't matter what the slope is, any value times 0. 0 times any value is 0, so this drops out and y equals b. So that's your y-intercept right there. b represents the y-intercept. b represents the y-intercept because that's the value of y when x is equal to 0. When x is equal to 0, 0 times m becomes 0 and y is equal to b. So when x is 0, y is equal to b right here. When x is 0, y is equal to b. That's your y-intercept. This represents the y-intercept. So we write this equation in this form. So y is equal to mx plus b. So whatever x is right here, we're going to write that first. So minus 900 times x plus b. B here is 100. So what does negative what does negative 900 represent? The negative 900 represents a slope. 
And what does positive 100 represent? The positive 100 represents the x-intercept, or rather the y-intercept. What about the x-intercept? Where does it cut the x-axis? Where, where does, where does it cut the x-axis? What is this x-intercept? What is this point? Well, we just look at this point. This point is 0, 100. B equals 100. B equals 100. What is the slope? The slope is 900. Slope is 900, negative 900. And it just so happens, just purely by chance, that the line that I drew is in fact negatively sloped. It wasn't, it wasn't pre-planned, it wasn't premeditated. It's just I happened to draw a line which is negatively sloped. It's just as well because we have a negative 900. So the slope of this line, slope of this line is negative 900. The question is, what is this point? What is that point? Let's find out, shall we? And for that, at that point, at this point here, y is equal to 0. At this point, y is equal to 0. The question is, what's the, what's the x-coordinate? Well, if y is equal to 0, we can substitute y is equal to 0 here and solve for x. So, y is equal to negative 900 x plus 100. y is equal to 0. Subtract 100 from both sides. And we're going to get negative 100 is equal to negative 900 x. We are not interested in this equation. We want to find out the value of x. Divide both sides by negative 100. Divide both sides by negative, oh sorry, ne negative 900 that is. And you will find, we need, the, we need the room, so I'm going to erase all of this thing now. We can erase this also, we can redraw it, so it looks a little bit better. And this implies that x is equal to negative 100 times negative 900, just, just positive 1 9. Positive 1 9. So let's draw it again. Let's draw it one more time. So it's a negatively sloped line. We found out the coordinates of this point, the y-intercept. y-intercept we just found out was 0, positive 100. We also know that the slope of this line, slope of this line we found out a little while ago. What did we say the slope was? Positive 1 9. Or rather, negative 1 9. The slope is, no, slope wasn't 1 9 x is 1 9. I'm, I'm getting confused. x equals to 1 9, which is the x-intercept right here. This, this point has a coordinate of positive 1 9 and 0. What did we say the slope was? The slope was negative 900. Negative 900. There we go. We have described the line. We have described the line by providing its shape. It's a negatively sloped line. Its x-intercept is positive 1 9. Its y-intercept is positive 100. That's about it. The question is, does it make any sense? Does it make it sense? Does it make any sense to you intuitively? Does it make any sense to you intuitively to claim that the slope of this line is negative 900? Let's take a look at it, shall we? Let's take a look at it. What does what does the slope of negative 900 mean? Slope we are claiming is negative 900. What does it mean when you say the slope is negative 900? What does it actually mean? What it actually means is that, what this, what this implies is that, for each, for each one unit, for each one unit that x goes up or down, y, y increases, well, sorry. If it goes up, then it should be decreased because the, if this part says goes up, then this part should say decrease. Because they move in the opposite direction, they move in the opposite direction. How do you know that? Because the slope is negative. Or here, if it goes down, then this increases. For every one unit that x goes up, y decreases by 900 units. One more time. We're going to read together. These are two sentences put together. Do you understand? So we're going to read the two sentences separately. It says, for each one unit that x goes up, y decreases, y decreases by 900 units. Or, 
for each one unit that x goes down, y increases by 900 units. And we can see that from here. Let's give, let's call this point A and let, let's call this point B. We're gonna, we're gonna begin our journey from A and we'll go to B. And we'll see what happens. At point A, at point A, y is equal to positive one ninth. Or rather, x is equal to positive one ninth. At point B, what happens to x? x goes from positive one ninth to zero. And as a result, what happened to the value of y? When, when x went down by one ninth, you see it's going down, it's going down from positive one ninth to zero. The value of x is going down. When x goes down by one ninth, when x goes down by one ninth, y goes up by a hundred. How does y go up by a hundred? Because y was zero here, now it's one hundred here. So when x increased in, by, the, by the amount of one ninth, y increased by one ninth, which means, which means, which means that if x were to go down by one, if x were to go down by one, you see nine cancels out, y would have to go up by 900. And the same exact thing will apply if you were to switch the arrow. Switch the arrows. If, if x goes up by one nine, so now we start from here. From here x is zero. If you go from b to a, x, x goes from zero to one nine. X, when x went up by one nine, the y went down by 100. It went down from 100 to a zero. It went down by 100. And therefore, for each one unit change in x, we'll see a, different, a change of 900 units in the value of y in the opposite direction. They move in the opposite direction because it's a negatively sloped line. Are we beating the dead horse at this point? Or is there something that we actually left out? That's about it, I think. Did we talk about the x-intercept? Yes, we have the x-intercept, we have the y-intercept, we have the shape, we, we have everything. Oh, we didn't talk about the range and the domain, which is the most important part. Let's talk about the domain. Are there any restrictions on x? The answer is no. The domain here is, there are no restrictions on x. Domain here is, again, set of all real values, real numbers. What about the range? Are there any restrictions on the value of y? The answer again is no. If it's the answer is no, it's a set of all real numbers. Before we go to part C, and this is something that I should have done actually a little while ago, when we were asking are there any restrictions on the values that x can take and y can take, I should have given you a simple example to make you understand what we mean by restriction. So let's take a look at, look at example now, uh, unrelated example, nothing, some, nothing from the book, uh, to make you understand what we mean by restrictions. Do you understand? Right here before we go to part C. We're done with part B. Take a look at this take a look at this function. Very simple function. Y is equal to 1 over x minus 5. What is the domain here? Do you know? Can you can you state the domain? What's the domain? In other words, what are the what are the values that x can take? What are are there any limitation on x? Are there any limitation on x? The answer is yes. Here here x is not allowed to be negative 5 or rather positive 5. x is not allowed to be positive 5. Why? Because if x were positive 5, if x were positive 5, we'll end up with 5 minus 5, which is 1 over 0, which is undefined. We can't have that. We can't have that. We have to have a value for y. x cannot be 5 here. At that point, it becomes undefined. So here, the domain is, here, x is not allowed to be 5. How do we say that? Here, the domain is set of all, set of all real numbers, except, except positive 5. That's how we say it. What's the range? What's the value? What's the, what are the permissible value for y? And the answer here is, y has no restrictions. The range here is a set of all real numbers. Let's take a look at one more. Let's take a look at one more. For example, if we were to told that x is equal to uh, uh, x is equal to it's a very simple one. Okay, very very simple one. X is equal to the root of x. But we can't take a we can't take a root of a negative number. We cannot. Why not? Why can't we take a root of negative a negative number? For that, we have, before we answer that question, we have to understand what it means 
when we take a, take a root of a positive number? What does it mean to take a root of the number? What does it mean when somebody asks you what is the root, what is, what is the value of root 9? What they're asking here is, what is that number? What is that number which when multiplied by itself, there is a number here and we're going to multiply it by itself such that when we do that we get positive 9. Well, the number here is positive 3. That's one answer. Or negative 3. Negative 3 times negative 3 is also positive 9. Therefore, root of 9 is equal to positive 3 or negative 3. There are two answers. But what if we had a negative 9 on the root sign? Negative 9 on the root sign. Again, the question is, what is that number which, when multiplied by itself, you see, it's being multiplied by itself, n and n, which, when multiplied by itself, gives us negative 9. And the answer to that question is, no such number exists. No such number exists. Why? Because a number, by definition, a quantity by definition, would have to be positive, in which case positive times positive is positive, or a quantity by definition would have to be negative. If it's a negative quantity, negative times negative is also positive. It is impossible to have a negative quantity being multiplied by itself and get a negative quantity. It's impossible to have a positive quantity being multiplied by itself and get a negative quantity. It doesn't exist. We cannot take a root of a negative number. That's the problem here. Here, if somebody asks us, what is the domain? What is the domain? The question is again is the same. I'm not going to read it all. I raised it. The question again is the same. What are the values that x, allow, x is allowed to take? What are the values? What are the values that x is allowed to take? Well, another way of asking the same question is what are the values that x is not allowed to take? Here, here, x can not be negative. Therefore, the domain here, domain here is set of all positive numbers or zero. X can be zero. X can be zero because then x is zero, y is zero, or it can be positive number, but x cannot be negative. X has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's, that's the domain here. The domain here is this. It has to be greater than or equal to zero. This is what we mean by restrictions. When they, when they talk about what are some restrictions, when we say there are no restrictions, then we write down that is a set of all real numbers. Let's look at part C. We talk too much about it. Part C. Give me one second. Okay? I'm just curious as to how much, how long I have taken. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still here. I'm not going to. I'm not going to do part C right now. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but somehow we managed to have consume 28 minutes already. If I were to do part C, it will end up being another 10-20 minutes, and it's going to be a very long video. I'll do part C separately in a separate video tomorrow. Okay. My plan was to do it together right now, but we're not. We're going to do it tomorrow. Okay. Bye now.